Hello, and thanks for tuning in to the Keto Answers Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Anthony Gustin, and this week joining me is Tony Wrighton. Tony's a little bit of a biohacker himself. He has a podcast, which I've been on, uh, amazing podcast, Zestology. And Tony and I chat a lot about a lot of crazy different biohacks that we're currently doing. It was a very nerdy conversation about the things that we do on a day-to-day basis and the things that we're doing to experiment to just try to up our personal game. So you're going to love this conversation. I learned a lot. Um, I always do when I chat with Tony. So tune in and I hope you enjoy. Before we get to the episode, I wanted to chat about our sponsor, Perfect Keto. Perfect Keto is all about making a ketogenic diet healthy and accessible. Whether you're reading all of our online guides or articles or enjoying Perfect Keto's exogenous ketones or any other keto-friendly products, everything you need to make keto work for you is at perfectketo.com. I know what you're thinking. Hey, aren't you the founder of Perfect Keto? Yep, that's right. And all of my insanely high standards have been put into making each and every product. My background as a functional medicine clinician helps me craft the cleanest and healthiest possible products and best information about a ketogenic diet. Head on over to perfectketo.com to learn anything you need to know about the ketogenic diet. And if you've never tried any of our products before, feel free to use the code Keto Podcast for 20% off your first order. With that being said, let's get into the show. All right, Tony, thanks for being on the show, man. Anthony, thanks for having me. I've been listening, so it's nice to be on it. Yeah, I mean, I had to have you on. I mean, Tony, Anthony, you know, we got we to gotta keep this train rolling. <laughs> I am an Anthony as well. So, yeah, so. Are, you, are you an Anthony or an Anthony? Anthony, yeah. So oh, wow. actually, before okay, I was well. 18, I was known as Tony. But then after that, I made the switch. It was weird because I had never called myself Tony before. I was just Anthony. I wrote it on, on everything. I introduced myself as that growing up since I was a kid. But everybody before I was 18 called me Tony. So I'm used to it. Um, I had this kind of a split personality with, with friends before and after. So, Well, it sounds very distinguished. And from now on, I'm going to use the American pronunciation, oh. fully Anthony. So. Oh, you, you're Anthony. <laughs> We we say Anthony. I say Anthony. Yeah, yeah. For me, oh, that yeah. sounds that sounds more professional, more <laughs> lord like, maybe. It does it. Oh well, <laughs> yes. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, well, Tony, why don't you just? Um, I I don't know how many of the listeners have have tuned in your stuff before. I know I've been on your show and it was, it was a blast. But can you give us a little rundown of your background and in kind of what you're doing these days? Yeah, thanks. It was really cool having you on my show. And obviously, we've kind of like, you know, I kind of started the the way that I found you was I started using perfect keto and I am keto myself as well. And I was like, wow, this product is great. And I really just sent an email to say, by the way, I really like your product. So that's kind of how I originally met you and and the rest of your team. Um, uh, Yeah, so I'm a TV presenter in the UK. And before that, I was a radio presenter. And I've been working on the biggest sports channel in the UK for about uh, 11 years now and kind of on the side I was always that self-development guy that self-help guy who was writing various uh, books around confidence and relaxation and persuasion and motivation at the same time um, so uh, I studied in the skills of NLP neuro-linguistic programming which we could talk about a little bit more and I studied to the highest level that you can study in that and I was always interested in doing more than just you know in the radio station that I presented on the music, it was very middle of the road, Anthony. <laughs> and uh, it was very, it was 80s, 90s and now, um, which gives you an indication as the kind of music. And I just kind of needed something to extend myself. So I really enjoyed doing the NLP stuff on the side. And that just kind of has now flourished into a podcast that I do called Zestology, which is about living with uh, more energy. So, and that's the podcast that you came on as well. So I think there's a plenty of crossover between our podcasts, but that's kind of what keeps me busy really yeah i think that a lot of people who get into the keto and um, paleo lifestyles and stuff like this are you know really just at the heart of it trying to improve their lives and you you mentioned that you were going through and you were fascinated for a long time about self-development self-improvement and things like that what got you on that route in the first place and kind of what stimulated well, that whole path yeah, it's funny because actually it's ended up being quite a big part of my professional life. But I just I went through a phase where I just didn't feel that happy. Um, and so I thought, well, you know, I'll do a five month NLP course and I'll just kind of go and learn a bit about it. And it was How did you get first exposed to, to NLP? And if, if people don't know about it, can you just give it like a little brief synopsis of what that is? Yeah. So the way I first got exposed to it was by kind of early Google, (laughs) basically. But NLP really studies how people do things well. And it's a set of skills that improves your communication with other people, but also yourself. And it helps you manage your moods really well and kind of run your life more successfully. So that's a kind of a little mini rundown of what NLP does. It's used a lot in therapy. It's used a lot in sales. 
uh, in uh, communications. A lot of people who want to be more persuasive end up using it. Um, sports psychologists use it quite a lot. And so that's kind of how I got into it. Just, you know, finding something that could help me feel a little bit happier. I, I guess I just went through a phase where I, I knew that I was quite happy and then I was kind of drinking a lot and you know, I was probably eating a lot of carbs at the same time. So that was possibly affecting my mood or my energy levels as well. I started using the NLP and I realized that, that I had the perfect place to try out the linguistic part of NLP, which was my radio show. So I started surreptitiously without telling my boss, using all these skills on my radio show and having some pretty cool results actually as well. So what were some of those results? Well, my boss called me into the office. So there was one day when I used the skills a lot. I really layered the skills on. I was a bit naughty, actually. I was using some of the persuasive language techniques. And the boss called me into the office. This is about two months after I've been using them. And he leant back in his chair and he put his hands behind his head. And that's always never a good sign when the boss is like, you know, hmm, shut the door behind you. And he said, I don't know what you've been doing, but your listening figures have gone through the roof. And it's absolutely true story. Whilst... My, I was on drive time, which isn't normally the biggest listen to show on a station. The breakfast show is the biggest show on the station. But my listening figures had got so big that they'd overtaken the breakfast show. Now, was it totally down to the NLP skills or not? I'm not really quite sure. But for the next three years, I had more listeners on drive time than the breakfast show guy did, which, as you can imagine, made him absolutely furious. <laughs> um, but really, that was just for me. I think that was a lot down to using these linguistic skills, which I was learning through NLP and through quite an overhaul of my language, becoming a better communicator and becoming more persuasive. And, you know, as I said, it's about communicating with other people, but also communicating with yourself. You know, people will have heard the stuff about negative talk and you know, the, the way that we talk to ourselves is really significant. So I started learning how to talk to other people and help my listening figures at the same time. It's amazing. What were some of the biggest things that you implemented that one were a lifestyle change for you among uh, mindset? And then what was another one that you, maybe a couple things that you were doing on your show that you learned from NLP that you, you started to employ? Well, it was really interesting because it was quite an overhaul of my language. And one of the things that NLP focuses on is the way that we all experience the world. So there's three main ways that we experience the world. The visual sense, the way things look, the auditory sense, the way things sound, and the kinesthetic sense, so the way things uh, feel to us. And so like physical feelings and also emotional feelings as well. And those are the three main senses. And we experience the world primarily through those senses. There's also the smell and taste, but we don't focus on them quite as much. And just simply in terms of when I was telling a story or trying to describe something, being a little bit more descriptive with the language I was using. So if I was, say, I don't know, giving away a holiday on my radio station or something, not just saying this is going to be a fantastic holiday, but saying, imagine the color of the sunset, the reds and the oranges and the purples all kind of linking in together. And imagine the sound of the birds chirruping in the trees and imagine the, the, the warmth of the air on your skin when you were in Barbados or wherever it is. And in a very simple way, you probably just worked out there. You know, I just started to help people connect with my language. I was also using some slightly naughtier persuasion skills, which people always enjoy hearing about, like things like asking questions that it's impossible to say no to. So you might say, um, I mean, as an example, you might say to your friend, would you like to go to the gig tonight? Um, and there's only really two answers to that, either yes or no. But if you say, um, how much would you like to go to the gig tonight? <laughs> the answer right. no doesn't really ap apply. You know, another one is if you want to persuade your kids to uh, tidy their room, you might say, tidy your room and they might just say no or if you say do you want to tidy your room before dinner or after dinner right, All of a right. Sudden, you're asking questions that it's impossible to say no to so as i say it was kind of a real overhaul of my language i was learning all this stuff and i was thinking how can i apply this to my radio show and um I think it did start to make me a little bit more persuasive i think the secret is to learn this stuff focus on this stuff but that not appear like kind of obvious and a bit annoying about it if you feel like someone's trying to hoodwink you or use all these inverted commas techniques on you it can be a little bit annoying actually so so for me the thing was to learn the techniques and then almost unlearn them once i'd kind of internalized it right and, and what do you think happened to your own self-talk when you learned all of these techniques obviously one of the biggest things especially when it comes to nutrition that that people find is that it's the intention and the mindset that matters more than anything 
Yeah, definitely. And actually, you know, I mean, the, the this was around the time that The Secret came out, <laughs> which is the, just the cheesiest book and film ever. I mean, I don't know if you've ever seen the film of The Secret, but mm. it's so cheesy. But it's good still, isn't it? It might be terrible, but it's still you, you can't help but feel motivated when you start to think, hmm, express my goals in the positive. You know, focus on what I want to go towards rather than what I want to come away from. Um, and in terms of myself, taught yeah just simply focusing on what i wanted to achieve rather than what i didn't want to achieve had had a had a significant impact on me definitely so what have you noticed that on other people too that maybe even speaking with them or seeing changes of how you communicate to other people how their behavior changes well one of the things that's significant in nlp it's it's quite a, a simple thing but it's the technique of rapport and we all do it pretty naturally anyway. You know, I mean, you'll often find that when you're uh, getting on really well with someone, you will tend to mirror their body language. And if they like, you know, if they start to kind of come in and they're almost whispering when they're telling you something a little bit conspiratorially, you will adopt the same voice and tone. You won't be shouting at the same time. And I think I noticed one of the things I noticed is that when I'm struggling to get rapport with someone, when I'm struggling to communicate effectively with someone, consciously mirroring at a body language, at a spoken level or an unspoken level can have a, quite an impact. And I remember going in to see my boss at Sky. I probably shouldn't talk about this since I'm still working at Sky now, but it's all right. I went, went in years ago and he's a fearsome man. I mean, you know, the stories of the way that he would dismiss people when he didn't like them was legendary. And he invited me into his office and he had this kind of very relaxed kind of sitting back in his chair body language. And I was terrified and I was quite new at the time. I think it's about 2008. So about 10 years ago when I joined Sky. But I forced myself to adopt the same angle in my chair that he had in his chair. And I spent about an hour in there. And I, I'm not quite sure what he was talking about because I was so terrified. Half the time I wasn't really taking in what he was telling me. But at the end... He'd kind of slowly gone from slumped in it into his chair to sitting bolt upright. And he said, Tony, this has been a good chat. Let's do this again. And I thought there's something quite weird there. But I do seem to have got some kind of rapport by matching him at a nonverbal level. So that's the kind of thing that, you know, you might be looking for in communication. Again, you, you know, you want you want communication to be genuine. You're not really obvious or weird about it. But these are the little things that you can focus on that can be effective. Is it something that you still work on to this day or is it something that somebody could learn and just kind of use a lot of the tools as foundations to move forward? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, you know, one really interesting thing is um, you could describe NLP or neuro linguistic programming as a study of how people do things well. And that's something that I've taken into my podcast. You know, when there's something that I would like to know more about how to do it well, I'll ask people on Zestology a certain amount of questions so I can start to learn. And that's what I've enjoyed listening to your podcast on, for example, because, you know, one of the things about being keto is there's such a kind of, there's a bit of a dearth of information out there. And sometimes you're not sure whether to trust the information or not. So in, in a similar kind of thing, you'll get, you know, it's all about finding other people who do things well, and then applying that into your life. And you can do it at different levels as well. So you might do it as a, um, you know, in one of the things that people often like to ask in uh, podcasts, for example, is what's what, what's the first 30 minutes of your day look like? And I always think that's a very helpful thing to, oh, well, you know, you meditate and then you might not switch your phone on until after breakfast or whatever it might be. But or and you might, you know, not have you might have I don't know, bulletproof coffee and then you might not eat anything till lunch or whatever it might be keto wise. But then I think looking kind of further up the chain, things like values and beliefs, what is so what, what does someone believe is important about themselves? How do they see their identity? What are their most treasured values? Even when you're trying to model how to do keto effectively or, or how to um, emulate someone's success in life, when you start to look at values and beliefs and identity, and if you're able to ask them those questions as well, then that can be very effective. That's a good point. And what are some of the things that you've noticed with either the happiest or most successful people that you've interviewed on your show, have you found any core values, beliefs that they all shared? Well, the, I, I have to say the same things come up again and again. Um, have you found that with your show as well? Yeah. I mean, I'm only a couple of episodes. In. I mean, I think we've recorded about 20 right now, but I think yeah. that, yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot of common stuff and even listening to other shows as well that kind of have the same approach, 
there's always some some commonalities there. So I was just interested to see if any of those yeah. popped out to you. No, there are. There are commonalities at every level, which I love. So at the kind of behavior levels, the things that kind of pop up again and again is diet. Uh, so high fat, low sugar diet. It's like it just pot comes up again and again. And all these different experts from different areas and even kind of experts – who aren't necessarily in the area of health, but are just massive um, high achievers in their field, like a film director or something like that. It'd be like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm on the uh, high fat, low, low carb diet. So that's an interesting one, you know, so lining up the circadian rhythms and focusing on uh, blocking out blue light in the evening and, you know, maybe going to bed half an hour earlier. That's another kind of a behavior one. At the values and beliefs level, I think one of the ones which often pops up is a gratitude is, is, very important whether people include it as a part of their meditation practice or just regularly schedule in a, a time or a part of the day to be grateful for what they've got um, helps people to not drift off into the future and say i'll be really grateful when i've got that sparkly shiny new yacht <laughs> right. it just brings you back into the moment and, and another one is seeing themselves as somewhat as someone who likes to give, as giving being a core part of their identity. I think that's something which seems to come up again and again and is certainly important for me as well. Interesting. So you noticed that nutrition was a huge part of everybody's behavior. When did it become yeah. important to you? Well, I, I can't remember how much we spoke about this on my pro, uh, podcast, Anthony, but I went to – I've always been interested in nutrition. I've always kind of been a bit of a hacker – you know, I've always been interested in trying certain things. And if I find something that works, tell my mates about it. The problem is that there's so much rogue information out there. And I went on holiday to the jungle a few years ago and I got very, very ill. Um, and I, I got a tropical virus. I had to come home early. I spent three months in bed. I couldn't even walk down the street. I wasn't going to my TV job and I never really knew if I'd get well again. And all these words like fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue who were being thrown around. I didn't know what was going on. And that was when I started to look into the paleo diet was the first thing that I did. And it started to kind of ask around and get some more good information on diet. And, and the, the same thing about sugar kept kind of popping up then. And so that was really when I started to look into diet. And since then, lots of other things went into kind of helping me to get better. Um, but that was yeah probably three or four years ago. Yeah, this seems like a very common path that a lot of people have made in the last, uh, I'd say, five to 10 years is they had something, some trigger event, and then they started exploring, found paleo, found that eating real food made a lot of sense, and then after that, switched to ketosis. And I only saw maybe recently, the last maybe four or five, six months, that people are now skewing that for just going straight to ketosis. I think one of the biggest things that people are missing doing that is that they never really get the value of eating real food first. And so this is, you know, people are getting the benefits of, of some transient ketosis, but they're not getting the benefits of eating real food. Is this something that you still make a priority to yourself right now is, is getting real food sources or is it just like chasing ketone numbers in a, in a blood meter? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, listen, I'm not going to lie. If you, if you score well on your keto blood meter, you always feel pretty good about yourself. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Confidence but, booster for sure. <laughs> yeah. But I always find it quite interesting that the best hacks for energy – really are the simplest aren't they and you know energy and wellness and certainly one of those for me is just eating well um i also find it the best way to get into ketosis um you know actually i, I really struggled with keto for a couple of months and what, what made you want to start ketosis after you were were paleo i i i started um i thought i was on a high high fat low sugar diet or high fat low carb diet but i think what i was actually on was a high fat medium carb diet <laughs> maybe 100 <laughs> grams or so or where we were at yeah exactly yeah 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 and I, I started working with a practitioner and i said to him the two or three things that i really wanted to work on and one of them was look i've always had a dodgy stomach from the age of probably 18 my stomach is every once in a while it goes haywire and it rules me it takes me out of action i'm just so low on energy i struggle to get through the day and it really hurts. It's kind of embarrassing when you're always going to the toilet and everything else. And he looked at, you know, he, he did some blood work on me and he said, I would recommend keto. And obviously 
ketosis has come up on my podcast loads of times and I was like oh no <laughs> I really don't want to do it he said you don't have to if you don't want to but then I looked into it and said oh all right I'll try it for a couple of months even though I don't want to do it I was very tired for one or two months and I think part of the reason is I didn't know about um perfect keto I didn't know about exogenous ketones I didn't know that you could just give yourself a little helping hand I think that's why I was so motivated to get in touch because once I started taking Perfect Keto, it did actually just take the edge off that tiredness. And so when I found it, I kind of used it a little bit for the first week or so. And then after that, I was in. And now I just use it whenever I want. Or whenever so just so, the, just so the audience knows, uh, Tony here was paid for that endorsement. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, well, I, I, want, I do want to be paid. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just kidding. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, this is one of the reasons why we created it as well. So, I mean, even people who are coming from like a paleo-ish diet, I've seen that it take, you know, the, the initial quote unquote carb, carb flu, keto flu, or what have you takes maybe, you know, seven to 10 days to get over. But even after that, if you've never really been in ketosis before, your body yeah. literally does not have the cellular machinery that it needs to start using fat for fuel. So you have a transitory time of, of maybe four to six weeks where you're turning over receptors, you're becoming more efficient at burning fat and breaking it down and putting it into the cells so the cells can use it for energy. And so it actually takes a little bit of time. And so this is one of the reasons why, you know, when we launched the product, I, I saw it as a, as a very beneficial thing for people like w when they're transitioning into that, because it actually, they've shown that using exogenous ketones helps increase those pathways and helps shift your body into that mode a little bit faster. And so you become what's known as fat adapted um, and so, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm glad that, that you saw benefit from that as well. Yeah. Um, did you notice that the gut problems, the energy stuff was solved, you know, within a couple of months, uh, a month or two? How long did it take you to, to find benefits? Well, I mean, first of all, that um, adaptation period, not that I want to put people off trying to get into ketosis and giving it a go. But yeah, it took me at least a couple of months before yep. I felt comfortable with yes, it. Yes, and this is normal too. And people will get super frustrated when it's been a week or two and they don't feel like Superman. Um, and I think that any time your body starts shifting to a new fuel source, if you haven't done that before, it's going to be challenging. I'm day nine right now on a carnivore diet, so eating only animal products, and we can chat a little bit I've more. Seen this. I've seen this on your um, on your social media. Yeah, what exactly yeah. are you doing? Are you allowed any vegetables at all? Nope, nope, just animal products. And so I feel like shit right now so i mean this oh, is no. it, yeah it's very similar to how i felt when i was transitioning initially to a ketogenic diet the first time i would say back in undergrad maybe 10 years ago and so i'm like oh that's right this is what this feels like but i mean from what i'm told we you know there's the same type of adaptation process so i mean i'll be reporting throughout the experiment here but i mean again the point is that anytime where you switch and you haven't done something this extreme before your body's gonna have a little bit of a lag time before it catches up yep. to using these fuels and, and the sort of um, input as something that it can can flourish on and so yeah. it took you a couple months besides the energy what else did you find well no, hang on i've just got one i've got one more question sure. on the omnivore yeah. diet or oh, the carnivore, carnivore diet yeah. sorry, rather um what's it doesn't sound great not eating any veggies what doesn't sound great about it well i, I don't know veggies are good plenty of nutrients plenty of vitamins it's nice to have them isn't it right but if you look at micronutrient density there's very little nutrients compared to, let's say, um, I mean, if you look at a spectrum, it's at the very top, liver and organ meats. Yes. Like 100 times as much nutrient density as any other vegetable that you might know, right? And then after that, grass-fed meat. And then after that, way down below is herbs and spices, then vegetables. And so, like, if you're looking at just a micronutrient com composition, it's actually, like... If you're eating vegetables, you're you're having the opportunity cost of not eating organ meat or or animal products, which are way higher in nutrient density. And so, yeah. I mean, I I could rant about this forever. I don't know what's going to happen, and so that's why I wanted to do it. And so, I did a ton of blood work before, and I'm going to release a bunch of blood work afterwards and oh, to show yeah. what's going on inside of my body, and then gut tests and things like that, and hormone panel. Everything's going to be released, and so. Yeah, I don't know, but it's been such a thing that that people and I have some hypotheses about why this is the case and why it works and why it mm. may not. So I will be discussing that as well. Oh, but cool. yeah, but yeah, I mean, I know you did on I, I know you did a whole series of posts on ketosis as yeah, well, which yeah. I, I found very helpful when I was getting into it. By the way, great, um, yeah, and, yeah. and the, the point is to like I don't know what I would respond to, and like this isn't meant to be advice for other people saying you're going to respond this way. More so, encouragement that you really need to figure out things on your own, like. I can read all the stuff all I want about a carnivore diet, but until I try it myself and really measure 
subjectively and objectively what happens for me as an individual, I'm never going to know. Like nutrition is yeah. such a nuanced thing and such an individual thing that people really need to be empowered to, to figure out things on their own and really experiment with their own bodies. Like this is one of those yeah. things where, yeah, I, I mean, it may be a little limiting for 30, 40 days. I'm not going to die. And so the only upside, there's only upside. Like I can, I can feel really awesome if I don't feel great or if I continue to feel like crap in the next two weeks, I'll just stop and I'll just eat whatever I was eating before. And so it's not like there's a huge amount of risk to it. And so, you know, figuring out, I think it's more beneficial for people who maybe have more serious health conditions that nothing else works for them. I think that this is where this has been employed the most. And so there's things that, you know, plants have innate defense mechanisms and in nutrients that a lot of people will assimilate and use as a little bit of a stress to adapt to just like you would with a workout. But for some people, their immune systems are so compromised that having just a little bit of that stuff can lead to a lot of problems. And so removing those can be very beneficial. And so, Mm. yeah, I mean, I don't know. We'll see how I respond to it right now. I don't feel great, but uh, my energy overall has, has actually been super, super stable. Um, I also just removed coffee completely from my diet and from, from my morning routine, and I'm feeling pretty good about it. Well, even removing coffee, that's, that's a, there's a little bit of an adaptation involved in that as well, isn't there? Yeah, I've done that a few times now, and I'm such a slow caffeine metabolizer, and it, it's been proving with, with gene tests and things like that, that mm. I don't notice that much of an effect. I can have a bunch of espresso before I go to bed and not know any difference. And so for me, going off of coffee has never i've done it a bunch and i used to be barista in high school so i was chugging crazy amount of of coffee then even until now and there's been periods where i go off of it for one to two months it's just that i really enjoy coffee and and then the taste of it and like kind of craft experiences like that where you get a really nail in the meticulous nature of things um so it's kind of it's kind of a bummer to, to skew that, but I mean, I think that just every now and then taking a break from certain things and not having things be constants Definitely. forever is, yeah. is always a good thing. And so I just figured that now, you know, to remove as many variables as possible, I'm just going to do animal products and then no supplements, no, um, no coffee, no, nothing else besides animal products. Yeah. And, and just going back to your question, you know, how, what are the con- kind of effects that I've noticed over the last kind of few months i still think the effects are, are rolling in to be honest i mean honestly my stomach has never been better and it does amuse me because you know when i go into my tv channel and i kind of get out my lunch and they're like where are the carbs and then they see me get out my supplements and they're like what what's all that are you ill <laughs> <laughs> um and uh, and i actually tra- i'm a bit of a geek in terms of tracking i like to fill out a little spreadsheet every night and um, fill out, you know, you were talking about working out what works for you individually in terms of diet. And um, as well as getting blood work and stuff like that, I like to fill out stuff that is objective. Like I know that I've eaten a keto diet on a particular day and my ketones were at a certain level. And then things that are a little bit subjective, like, okay, my energy levels were 85% today. And I've been doing that for well over a year. And it's come up with some really interesting results. And the main one was that When I shifted my diet to keto, my stomach and my energy levels were about 7% better per day on average, which is is pretty significant, you know. And so that's, you know, that's for me the the kind of, I've actually got a little bit of proof there that it works. Yeah. So you are, you said tracking this stuff and noticing some benefits still rolling in. How long has it been since you transitioned to a ketogenic diet? Well, it was last, uh, it was about nine 10 months ago. Okay. So you're yeah. still relatively early. Have, have you gone in and out of it or is it kind of full force 100% all the time? Yeah. Well, in January, me and my girlfriend for the whole month, we went to Thailand and we did some great stuff. You know, we went trekking and we went and stayed at a meditation retreat and we went to the islands and we did loads of exercise and all the rest of it. Um, but I have to say that it is quite hard because I was eating out every meal right. for, thir- for 30 days. First world problems. I understand that, Anthony, here. But um, you don't always know. They love to put a little bit of sugar in food over there. And because yeah. I don't eat because I don't eat gluten either. That was like that was a, a total faff all of its own when I was trying to order. But um, I would kind of cycle in and out a little bit. And I could tell that from my uh, ketone levels, but felt absolutely fine. And now I'm at the stage where especially certain carbs, butternut squash seems to work perfectly for me. I can have that. My ketones might come down a bit. Next day, I'll be fine. And in fact, I'm, I am having a few more carbs now, especially after I work out just to try and put on a little bit of muscle as well. And it seems to be fine. 
It's great. Yeah. And this is one of the things that I noticed too, is that after, you know, eight months, a year of being in it pretty consistently that I'm able to tolerate going in and out way easier. And this goes back to the yeah. metabolic machinery hypothesis that you have certain receptors in your cells that you don't really want to downregulate all the carbohydrate receptors either. You know what I mean? And so this is like yeah. where, where you should be able to tolerate either fuel. And so if you've never used ketones in your life, it's going to be a lot of work to transition to use those fuels, right? But the same thing goes for use, utilizing carbohydrates as fuel. So like, I want to dispose of glucose in my bloodstream if it is in there, and I don't want to, my body to think it's a foreign substance. And so, and, and I just feel good, and I like having the flexibility of, you know, when I travel, eating local food and not freaking out about it. And But when I do that now, like you said, you know, especially if I time them appropriately and put them around workouts or maybe later in the evening, I will mm -hmm. notice that the next day I'll be right back into ketosis, no problem, or maybe a day and a half, two days, but you know, these strategies now with you know, maybe a little bit of fasting, maybe a little bit of hyperdosing of exogenous ketones, while yes, it, it increases your blood ketones, but it also helps me just get back into ketosis, nutritional ketosis way quicker as well. Mm. And so, yeah, it's, that's, that's fascinating. So you said that you do this little tracking sheet. What else are you tracking on there? And do, do we talk about my tracking spreadsheet on your podcast? I can't remember. I, I don't know. I don't think we did. Yeah. So I have a very, but very similar. You thing, do. Oh, great. Yeah. yeah. So this thing I've been keeping for a couple of years now, and that's that's a daily yeah. thing as well. That you know maybe people like us, it's 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 yeah. right on point. Oh, that's cool. I, yeah. I don't think I've ever met anyone else who does it. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> people see it, and like there's so I have like a, a yearly, a monthly, and a quarterly tab. Yeah. I mean, a daily tab on here. And so what I what I do is I you know I have daily tracking that I I track everything, and that goes into the monthly. I do monthly reviews, and then that goes into a yeah. yearly tab, and so. That has been going on for about three years, and when people see the spreadsheet, they're like, "What is what is wrong yeah. with you? Are you are you okay?" Like, <laughs> oh god, yeah, that's amazing. And what do you use? Do you do it on a, on a simply on your laptop on an Excel spreadsheet? Yeah, I just do uh, Google Sheets. Okay, I've been using an app called Data Explorer, ah, which um, which is quite good because you can track this stuff, but then it will work out the correlations for you kind of there and then. Ah, interesting. So literally while we were chatting, I just checked the whole, the, the latest stats on carbs against my energy levels, just so I could tell you that it was, you know, around 7%. Um, but then you can also export it to Excel or whatever else. Um, I realize I sound like a total geek now, but there you go. And I track loads of stuff and I, I tend to kind of retire the things that I'm not interested uh, in tracking anymore. At the moment, I'm doing some fairly aggressive methylation. So I'm tracking some of the supplements that I'm using around that, you know, to check that it doesn't upset my stomach at the same time or upset my energy levels. When I... Um, when I started uh, taking some methylated supplements a couple of years ago, I felt great for a couple of weeks. And then I felt terrible because for the first time, my body was like, great, we've got all these methylated supplements. Let's just throw all the toxins out. But then there was nowhere for the toxins to go. So they were kind of swilling around my system. So this time I'm doing it in a much more measured way. And I'm feeling pretty good about it. Yeah, this is a good point to, to dive a little bit deeper. Um, can you explain to people who don't have experience with this? you know, how you got into that and why methylated supplements are important and you know, your, your strategy moving forward here? Yeah. So I did a blood test and my homocysteine level was very high. Mm -hmm. and, how, and that really scared me when I look in, looked into it. I consulted Dr. Google <laughs> um, and um, homocysteine levels, high homocysteine levels are a more, far more accurate method of deciding whether someone might have future heart disease than cholesterol, for example. Um, and it turns out that when you have high homocysteine levels, ob often there's something genetic that is stopping you from keeping those homocysteine levels down and processing nutrients and vitamins properly. And please bear in mind that I'm not a doctor. Anthony is, I'm not. And I'm just like giving you the slightly ropey version of how this all works. But essentially, some people methylate very well. Some people, because of genetics, don't methylate so well. And that is me. Now, there's quite a simple way of getting around this and starting to methylate properly. And that is to take methylated supplements. And I think the ones you want to focus on, methylated B6, methylated folate, and methylated uh, B12. And there may be some other stuff which Anthony can tell you. But when I started taking it, and I, and I know this is the case for other people as well now, um, my body was like, brilliant. He spent 40 years not processing vitamins properly. Now, We've got all we're actually getting the stuff that we need and we can process it quickly and efficiently. And that meant that there was a lot of toxins stored up in my body, which all kind of for the first couple of weeks, I felt amazing. And then they just 
flooding my body at the same time. So um, that was, I had to stop the methylated vitamins, wait a year or two, literally that long to sort myself out and start slowly again. So, and have you just um, been ramping them up slowly? And- very slowly. So like once, so once a week, then once every other day, and then now once a day. Have you tracked to see okay. if you're yeah, and just being very, very mindful? Do you have a spreadsheet yeah. column for your homocysteine levels? Uh, well, no, because that's not something you can track every day. <laughs> right, right. So, but but I so I, I I tracked them three months ago. Do you know what though? I actually know they've come down because homocysteine and inflammation are quite closely linked. I think, right. and I can just tell that I'm so much less inflamed than I used to be. You know, I used to get a kind of a niggly back sometimes or, you know, my knee might feel a bit sore or I just, I'm not feeling any of that at the moment. And I'm absolutely sure it's just my body working more efficiently. So, you know, it'd be really interesting to see. I'll have to give you a little update in a couple of months, but I did a homocysteine test about uh, three months ago and I'll probably do another one in a month's time or something like that. I think they're quite cheap to do, aren't they? And, yeah, they're you know, Really, really good idea. It all came out of the... Um, uh, the homocysteine test that I did originally and then doing that 23 and me and, and finding out that so you I was the yeah. MTHFR mutation. Yeah. MTR as well. And, um, the CBS mutation, which, uh, which is quite significant as well in the way that you process sulfurous foods and stuff like that. And, um, and actually uh, something else with the keto diet, have you interviewed, a Dr. Dale Bredesen? No, I have not. He's he's a great guy. He'd be great for your podcast. And I, I'm actually, I've not interviewed him as yet, but I think I'm speaking to him next week. And he is a world expert on APOE4, the out, Alzheimer's gene, as they call it. Right. Um, and one of the things he says as part of his protocol is, if you've got this gene, you are more likely to get Alzheimer's, but there's loads of things you can do to mitigate that and actually make it less likely that you're going to get Alzheimer's. One of them is eat a high fat, low carb diet. And another one is intermittent fasting for at least 14 hours a day, preferably 16. And so that's both those things I, I guess I was kind of doing already, but it's, it's so nice to have such a world expert in this area in you say, Oh, actually, yeah, I'm doing that already. And he's saying that, you know, that's the right thing to do. It's kind of nice confirmation if you like. Are you an APOE4 carrier? Yeah. One header was one, uh, yeah, hetero, yeah. not homo. Yeah, yeah. Which so we, how about we, you? Yeah, I'm not. Um, and we could nerd out about all this stuff it, it, as yeah. much as possible as well. But um, you mentioned intermittent fasting. Is that something that you're doing as well? And when did you start using that? Yeah, well, do you know, I've been doing that for years. I mean, when I first heard Dave Asprey talk about Bulletproof Coffee a few years ago, it was, and as I said, I always had a bit of a dodgy stomach. And I started just having a Bulletproof Coffee in the morning. And my stomach felt so much better for not having a big breakfast. I don't know, for, for me, it just agreed with me. And then I kind of realized that, okay, well, bulletproof coffee isn't quite intermittent fasting. <laughs> it may be all fat, but it's still, you know, it's still kind of nutrients of a sort. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I've been, I've been doing it for a, for a few years, really, with, you know, either black coffee or just water. Um, there seems to be slightly conflicting views on whether coffee counts as part of that intermittent fast. What would you say? I think that people need to ask why they're doing it. You know what I mean? And so if it's for, for instance, metabolic regulation, I don't think it matters at all. I think that a coffee would actually be beneficial in that case. If people are doing a longer fast and maybe doing three to five days and looking towards autophagy and things like that, maybe. Mm-hmm. I don't think that we're at a point where we have conclusive evidence on that. But this is like you know, fasting has so many different arms to it and so many different benefits that we need to ask ourselves when we're doing it and using it, what is the goal, right? Is it increased fat burning? Is it increasing ketone production? Yeah. Is it for decreased inflammation? Like what exactly are you targeting? And then work backwards from there. And I think that that depends a lot. I think if it's just an intermittent fast, like 16 hours, 20 hours, whatever. Uh, and, and I'm not a big fan of like putting timelines on your fasting. I just think that, you know, if you're not hungry, don't eat. And if you're hungry, eat. And, and that's yeah. that's how I approach it. And because and some days I go a little bit further. Like yesterday, I ate tons of meat at around noon, and it's almost that time again. And I haven't eaten since then. And I'm just going to mm. keep pushing it and go until as long as I can go. And so I just listen to my body and operate that way. But if I think if it's a shorter duration, I don't think you know. I would hypothesize we don't know exactly, but I would hypothesize that coffee would probably be beneficial more than it would be harmful. And 
barring, like you said, if you don't put a ton of butter and other things in it, like I think that yeah. it's a pseudo and in, you know intermittent fast when you are adding these caloric things. But I mean, just ha- having coffee in there black, I don't think would be you know detriment to to a short term fasting. Yeah. And it just makes it so much easier because, you know, I mean, you can, I could fast for 20 or 24 hours if you just like wake up in the morning and think, well, you know, I can have a coffee or two and then eat whenever I want to eat. Right. Without that, I think there's like there's not those signposts in the morning that make you feel good. Um, and it, of course, it does elevate the mood a bit as well. So I would tend to have a coffee. Sometimes I do it without coffee as well. And certainly if I've done like I've done I've just started experimenting with, you know, the odd 24 hour fast here and there. And uh, especially when I've been flying, actually, like when I flew back from Thailand, I did it. And then I then I didn't have any coffee because I I wanted to do it properly kind of thing. Um, But uh, but it's great to hear you say that you think it could probably be beneficial. And actually, do you know what? I mean, it sounds like a long time doing it for 16 or 18 hours, but you end up feeling great by the end of it and not even that hungry. Right. I think that a lot of this, too, is just habit forming. And so. One of the things, even when I transitioned to this carnivore diet nine days ago, I was like, holy shit, I am snacking a lot and just like eat, eating way more than I probably should be. And like, I'm not overweight. I don't have any problems that I need to worry about. And I always choose a great food quality, but it's like, okay, I have a jar of nuts here and I snack on this with some coconut butter or whatever. And just the ha- like removing those habits has been like really mentally challenging for me. So I think yeah. a lot of times when people go from eating bre- breakfast every single day like you said, maybe having that cup of coffee in the morning will help bridge people away from that instead of just removing that ha- habit entirely. Like humans do not like just open and broken habit loops without replacing them with things. It's way easier to replace a habit loop with something in, something new or something existing. And so I think doing that can be beneficial for people instead of just going straight, you know, from from eating breakfast or even having a standard American diet to jumping in and doing this as crazy two three day fast or like a water fast or even a dry fast um interesting yeah. point that you made on traveling with fasting i always do that i actually found that doing fasting and pairing it with uh, so i do have coffee typically when i when i'm flying long distances and then i have ketones only and it doesn't matter how long the travel day is it could be 36 hours or you know four or five yeah. and then whenever i land um you try to get like a maybe 15 minute sprint type workout, whether that's just, you know, Tabata style workout in my hotel or Airbnb, or if they have a gym or outside and running. Um, and I noticed that jet lag minimal and inflammation levels minimal. And I feel fantastic no matter how many time zones I'm jumping. Have you noticed anything like this happen with maybe your experience that you use back from Thailand? Yeah. And, you know, and I've done it on a few uh, transatlantic flights now as well. And I have to say it does make a difference. And I always used to get a bloated belly on a flight. I think it's just because you're sitting in one place. So you eat food on the flight, which isn't very good quality. And it just sits in your stomach. There's, it's not moving around. You're not moving around. And it just sits there festering. Well, well yeah. I and, mean, look at, look at the environment you're in too. I mean, you're getting recycled oxygen that is pumped yeah. out from the front of the cabin and goes all the way back. So if you're in, in the back of the, the, the plane, you don't get as much, nearly as much oxygen as you would just in a normal environment. The mm. lights are all crazy. It's super noisy. The food is toxic. And so you, you have toxic f- inputs in a toxic environment. I mean, no wonder why most people feel like crap after a flight. Yeah. Yeah. And and I have to say, I have noticed a difference since just not eating on flights. Simple as that. Even if it's not like a big extensive fl- fast or anything like that. But I've got a big dilemma coming up because in a few weeks, I am actually coming to your home city, Austin. Nice. Um, yeah, I'm coming for... Paleo effects, yeah. And I managed to get the flights. I'm going to sound a bit boasty here now, but I'm not boasty. Well, I am a little bit. But I managed to get the flights on air miles, and we're flying first class. So, you know, I really do kind of want to eat just because I'm in first class. And I may well not anyway, um, but we'll see how it goes. But, you know, when you're first class, and I don't know if there's like a chef. I'd, I've never done it, so yeah. I don't really know. But what, it's, what it's all going to cook for me. What airline it's, um, British Airways. British has pretty good first class options like they're, they're one of the only Ooh. airlines when i fly so i do the same thing i only do points yeah. and i do like i do not pay for first class yeah. flights but as yeah. much as i can choose to, to get, get them on points i think it's think that minimizing stress in awful positions when you're flying it like if it w- would ruin three or four days you know getting there and i feel like crap for that long i think it's worth it to upgrade and use more points to do that um, mm. but they, they have a pretty good um 
pretty good menu option there. Um, one of the things I also yeah. don't do that everybody seems to do in airports and when they travel. And I'm not against drinking, but it seems like it's it's like people's excuse to drink whenever they travel. It doesn't matter the time yeah. of the day, 8 a.m., 10 a.m., whatever. Like people will be ordering <laughs> massive amounts of drinks at the airport and at the in the airplane. And I'm not saying again, like uh, I drink f- not frequently, but I do. And this is one of the things that removing that entirely and be like, okay, travel day, not drinking at all has made a giant mm. difference. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. Um, and actually there's one thing I will not do on the flight over and that is drink because it just doesn't agree with me on a flight. Right, I'm exactly. enough of a lightweight as it is. And I'm like you, I, dr- I drink sometimes, but not that often, but drinking on a flight. Yeah. I'll just, I'll just feel terrible. But, um, but once I get to Austin, I might have a glass or two of biodynamic wine and, and maybe see you at some point as well. Yeah, great I'd to, love to. Great dry, to say hello. You can have some dry farms or what? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I was, Todd was over in Todd from Dry Farm Wines was in London last week actually, and he'll be there serving wines and yeah, yeah, it'll be it'll be a nice week. Yeah, and if, if nobody's used that stuff before or had Dry Farm Wines, I would highly recommend it. That Dry Farm Wines are the only wines I have because they test yeah. everything to be zero sugar and free of any type of additives, which is actually really really hard to find in the U.S. because most U.S. importers require those things to be in the wines, but they specifically test and then import themselves. And so they don't produce wine, but they they get stuff from all around the world. And so you have a, a yeah. great variety. And I feel amazing after I have those. Like the only thing I ever drink is is that, maybe one to two glasses or uh, mezcal. And so one, I just like it. I love the taste of it. But same type of thing, the Mexican government didn't want tequila to be, um, so tequila was mass produced and the quality was driven down significantly. And so yeah. with, with mezcal, which is, it's kind of like tequila, it's just using different agaves. They have a really tight Mexican regulation by the government to make sure that the the quality of all mezcal is very, very high. And so you, you never get any weird stuff in there. And it's, it's basically just the distillation of different agaves. And so I always feel fantastic after I have that too. So just mezcal neat or dry farm wines is pretty much the only thing that I drink wow. nowadays. Yeah. Uh, what, about your, what about yourself? Well, similar. You know, I mean... Uh... I'm always the one that my mates are like, oh, here we go. Because I'll say, have you got any organic wine, you know, in a restaurant? Or have you got any biodynamic wine? Um, I actually, uh, Todd, Todd is a friend of mine and has been on my podcast a couple of times. And he is absolutely insistent that we could drink, I could drink two bottles of wine personally whilst recording a podcast and be fine and have no hangover the next day. And I don't believe him. Even though I think dry farm wines are amazing, yeah. I still don't believe him. <laughs> Maybe he just drinks a, a ton of wine. Well, yeah, but he reckons I could as well. So yeah, I guess yeah. I'll have to try it out one day. Yeah, experiment but, um, with him. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. We'll do it, it, Maybe we'll do an in-person one in Austin. And we'll just we'll get six bottles of wine. Everybody will have two each and, and we'll see where it goes. We should definitely do that. You know, what? I, one of the things I loved about Austin is all the – all the restaurants and cafes are so switched on to organic produce, locally grown, grass fed, you know, meat that's massaged to within an inch of its life. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, you know, it's just like really nice. And then biodynamic wine as well. It's really nice to have so many restaurants and bars which are so into this kind of thing. It's great, actually. Yeah, it's been fun like the last five years seeing this this shift. So I, I started getting into paleo type nutrition maybe eight, ten years ago. Yeah. And Seeing this a shift, like obviously I've, I've lived in hotbeds, Portland, San Francisco, and now Austin. So like it, it's pretty easy for me to find places. But now when I travel around, it, it you know I was in um, Berlin not too long, like a couple months ago, and they had a, a keto focused restaurant there that just did paleo and keto food. Incredible! Like like wow. this stuff is now popping up all over the world, and so it's really fun for me to travel and just kind of yeah. see these things out and see how the local cultures adapt to this type of, uh, of way of living and eating and it's, it's pretty fascinating we, we certainly haven't got that yet here in london um, yeah. and the healthy option in the kind of work canteen is normally fish and chips yeah <laughs> that kind of thing time, but, to lead, um, time to lead the charge son yeah yeah exactly well hopefully i am a little bit and that's actually one of the things that's quite nice about doing this podcast over here you know the fact that i always think in many things america is just a little bit you know a few years ahead of us and there's loads of people undoubtedly super interested in things like uh high fat low carb diet or just you know healthy living in some ways but there's certainly not as much competition for me as there is people in the u.s so that's quite nice yeah so where do you see uh, um, nutrition going as far as like you know keto now is there anything that you're starting to experiment with yourself take things to the next level so to speak 
Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, this, I, I'm experimenting all the time. At the moment, there's a couple of things that I'm very excited and interested in. Um, the first is that I've started supplementing with two supplements that have impacted my sleep quite considerably, and that is L-arginine and L-ornithine, um, which is uh, very interesting. I was reading Dave Asprey's book on fertility, and he said it's great for it's great for your sperm count. And it's great for your sex life and it's great for sleep. And I thought, well, it's like a triple whammy. There's nothing, there's nothing there, right? to lose. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I have to say, I haven't measured my sperm count, but the other two <laughs> seem to be doing quite well. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Just notch it in your spreadsheet and good to go, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm not tracking that. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's something that I'm excited about. Um, another non-nutrition thing I'm really interested in is, have you heard of um, ammonia oxidizing bacteria? Nope. It is. It's, there's a company called Mother Dirt, and there are other companies. That oh do yes, that. yes, yes. I know yeah, them. So you, Great company. You, yeah, and you you spray really you spray bacteria onto your skin, and I, I was just kind of quite interested. In fact, I spoke to them a couple of years ago, and they sent me some samples, and I'm ashamed to say I never used them. And then more recently, I was like, you know what? I'm going to look into that again. Me and my girlfriend have been using it for the last couple of months, and I have to say it's been with incredible results with skin, like genuinely quite quite stunning results how's it um, affecting your sperm count well it's not been affecting my <laughs> sperm count so it's, it's not that good <laughs> no you no know, it's good yeah. stuff i actually have some in my fridge as well um do you really yeah, yeah. So my, my, i had really dry skin per certain parts of my skin and spraying this bacteria on my skin seems to have just got rid of it so uh, it might also be a continuing benefit of the keto diet as well. But, you know, I love testing out all these things and inevitably three quarters of the things that I try get discarded and a quarter go into the kind of supplements drawer or, you know, are a lifestyle practice that keeps getting used. And I think Mother Dirt might be might be one. I presume they'll probably be at paleo effects as well. So hopefully I can say hello to them there. Yeah, I think they're usually there. Um, yeah. Yeah. Awesome company. Um, so to put you in the hot seat versus you always asking people what their morning routine is and how they start the day and yeah. um, what does yours look like? Well, it involves, I was lucky enough last year to go to 40 years of Zen, which is a meditation retreat just outside Seattle where they, they basically put electrodes on your brain for a week to measure your brain waves and see how they're affected by different styles of uh, meditation. And it, was the first time that I've developed a consistent meditation practice because I could look at these. It, you're, you're someone who likes data, Anthony, and so am I. And the, 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 the geek out on looking at the graph and the difference between the start and the end of an hour-long meditation session and then the extraordinary difference in my brainwaves between the start of the week and the end of the week, I was like, I've got to... I've got to start the day with a bit of meditation from now on. I think also my, I've got a very kind of alive mind, which needs calming down every once in a while. So it involves 10 to 15 minutes of meditation. What and type then, of meditation? Uh, well, I, I'm tending to do transcendental at the moment. So just repeating a mantra. Um, but also sometimes it'll be a gratitude meditation if I fancy something different. And actually the meditation that worked best for me at 40 years of Zen in terms of the data was what do they call it? A detached observer meditation where you're really just kind of noticing the thoughts as they come and then telling yourself something along the lines of, oh, this too shall pass and then just letting it kind of drift away. Yeah, that's that's um, how I do most most days. Is it? Uh, yeah. And, it, and it's worked very, very uh, well for me. And I noticed that like it's really momentum based. And so it's just like, you know, if I was training for a marathon and I took two weeks off, you know, good luck running 15 miles, right? And so this is the same type of thing where yeah. You know, every day I do it, the the better and more effective it becomes. I haven't measured brain waves, but uh, definitely the depth of the meditation is, is increases increases every time when I'm more consistent. And meditation for me is one of the things that I track in my spreadsheet. Um, yeah, that's so, awesome. Yeah, I, I do track it as well. And, you know, it seems to me that my energy levels are higher when I do it. Not massively, but they're higher. But it's not quite energy that I get from meditation. It's calm. Right. And it's just like it's 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 me at my best. Yeah, I, I can um, always focus way more throughout the day. I'm less irritable, even if like yeah. huge stuff comes up, like some some giant virus to put out in the last few weeks. And I just, while meditating, like it has been consistent meditation. And I've just looked at him like, oh, okay, well, I guess we'll just deal with this mm -hmm. as, as it comes. We're like normally crisis mode, like, ah, all that stuff is going on. It's like it, it just helps kind of clarify, you know, what, what to do when a problem arises. And, and that yeah. is very worth it to me as well. Uh, for, there is. For, 
What's that? Yeah, there is something else though that I that I think ties into a meditative state, although it's not meditation as such. And to me, it's possibly the most successful neuro hack that I do on a daily basis. Um, and that is very simply switching all technology off for at least two hours a day. And I do track this as well on my spreadsheet. And sometimes I'll do more than two hours. And invariably, the days that I switch off technology for a long period of time, that's my best days. And not only that, I can sometimes get a lot of work done because I'll just be more creative. I'll be more inspired. I'll be writing stuff down. I'll be having ideas. And I'll also just be having fun. I'll be me at my best. So that is something that I've been doing for a few years and it's had a really significant impact on me. Technology can frazzle me out of it. And I think especially the kind of connectivity within technology. And I think um, when people ask, what is neuro-linguistic programming? A good way to explain it is that actually it's quite a long name and it might be better to just call it neuro hacking, you know, working out the little hacks that make your brain work at their best. And for me, when I switch off, it just makes me work a lot better, think a lot deeper and get away from my slight, slight addiction to Facebook. Yeah, I mean, it can be tough to do. I usually go to sleep with airplane mode on and then just don't turn it yeah. on until, until I have to. Um, that's been oh, a little great. hack Oh, that's for me. so good. Yeah. yeah. And then question going back to the meditation do you mentioned tmd did you do the actual certification or the the class oh no okay. no i interviewed um emily fletcher who uh runs ziva meditation and she's she just told me you know a mantra based meditation she just kind of explained how she does it and just did it from that read a couple of books but i don't even really know if i'm doing it right or wrong but i think i probably am doing it right you know and um yeah, yeah this something I've been on the fence of, about doing for years now, and I'm just like, ah, uh, you know, going to this class is expensive, and it's like four or five days, and you have to do all this stuff. I'm like, do I have the time for that? But this is probably one of those times where I just need to bite the bullet and do it. I, I don't think. I mean, I, yeah, I kind of feel like anything where, you know, I went to um, is it Sharon Salzberg? I don't know if you've heard of Sharon Salzberg. She's mm -hmm. quite a famous meditation expert, and she did a one day course in London recently, which I went to, and the whole day was different styles of meditation and trying them out. And she's written this book on all these different ways that you can meditate. And I thought, fantastic. That gave me the confidence to mix it up. Sometimes I feel like a gratitude meditation. And then we all went outside and walked around in the park for an hour and did a walking meditation. And she was so kind of unsnobby about it. She was just like, yeah, well, you know, try all these styles, just do, do whatever, do whatever works, you know? And that's, a, it's a good mantra that really, isn't it? You know, do what works in terms of the meditation if it works, then do it. Yeah, I, lo I love that approach. Um, so rest of your morning routine? Well, I mean, you know, that's like there's there's not too many rules. And it's, it's quite interesting, actually. I would love to have a more significant routine in terms of the first 72 minutes of my day are involved, you know, so getting outside and going into a cold plunge pool and all that. But my job with Sky is so different from day to day. Some days I'll be working till midnight and I won't get back here until one o'clock in the morning. And some days I'll be up early working there. And that's just the nature of working on a 24 hour sports news channel. So um, it makes a very rigid routine a little bit different. But to be honest, you know, I, I probably wouldn't want any more than it is now, which is meditate, not switch the phone on straight away. That's a pretty good start for me. Yeah, what about the first meal of your day? What does that usually look like? Well, it's it's normally either a black coffee, which it was this morning, and then um, it might be a bulletproof coffee. I'll I'll hope that I will have intermittent fasted for about 14 hours. But again, I'm not kind of too rigid on it. And then so the first meal of the day today was uh, about 1.30 after a black coffee uh, for kind of breakfast. And it was um, grass fed beef kind of uh, chili. Um, with a little bit of butternut squash on the side. Butternut squash, by the way, fantastic carb for me. Just doesn't seem to take me out of ketosis. Um, and uh, a nice salad on the side with some apple cider vinegar and um, olive oil. Sounds fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and koyo. I'm addicted to koyo. Do you have that over there? Yeah, the coconut yogurt. Yeah, I'm just addicted. But actually, I went into a Whole Foods in the States when I was over there in October and it seemed like the nutritional information for Koyo in the States is different to what it is in the UK because it's quite low carb over here, but it seemed like there's quite a lot of sugar in the one in. Well, that's what the Americans like, my friend. 
yeah that is true you guys couldn't have it unless it's got 20 grams of sugar in it right yeah and i've talked to people who have formulated products being in the cpg space now um the consumer packaged good and food food scene is that yeah when it, when formulating for different countries but basically every other country besides the united states can be way lower and more bitter because people are used to no having those way. tastes and here people like intentionally need to jack the sugar up even things like coca-cola like that's why things like people like the mexican coke here i don't know if you know about this phenomenon um, the hipsters like it because no. it's like not as not as su- sweet, and so they, they right. the actual sweetness of of most products, even for international brands, is way sweeter here than anywhere else. Yeah, it's such a strange country full of contradictions, isn't it? Because oh, yeah. you know, I mean, honestly, I have got a list so long of things that I'm looking forward to buying when I come to America that I can't get here in terms of not just keto stuff, but all kinds of natural products. It's just incredible the range you've got there compared to anywhere else in the world. And then you have stuff like you just told me that the co- you can't buy Koyos over there because they're too high in sugar compared to over here. It's just so there's so many contradictions to the USA. Yep, but it is what it is, and I, I like it for a lot of other reasons too. Yeah, um, definitely. Yeah, well, I can't wait to be there soon. Yeah, excited for you to get here. Um, and yeah, I think we're coming up on, on an hour now, so I'll, I'll let you yeah. go get to your day, your your hectic schedule oh, with your with your with yeah. your sports network. Um, why don't you just mention where people can find you if they want to learn more about maybe NLP or what you're doing with the podcast? Yeah, thanks. Well, the podcast is called Zestology, and obviously Anthony has been a guest on it in the past, which was brilliant. And maybe we get a chance to record another one in Austin. That'd be nice. Um, and, uh, there's loads of stuff on NLP. There's an NLP tab on my website, which is tonywrighton.com. And one of the main things I put on that tab is explaining what NLP actually is. <laughs> so if you're interested in what NLP is, think of it as neuro hacking and there's plenty more on the website. All right, Tony, thanks so much. And looking forward to hanging out in about a month. Definitely. Thanks. Anthony. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Keto Answers podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. But even if you didn't, I would love a review. Just go over to iTunes, wherever you listen to your podcast and pop in a review so we can get found by more people, get better guests and have the information that you need. So please go to iTunes, wherever you listen to your podcast and leave us a review. And if you're new to keto, head on over to perfectketo.com slash podcast and enter your email for all our top tips and guides on getting started with the ketogenic diet. Thanks. And we'll see you next time. Bye.